Welcome back to the Camp Chronicles podcast. This episode is most definitely for those of you who want to understand carp and watercraft at a deeper level. I sit down with Ben Pinager and he goes into the science of carp, their surroundings, other critters within the lake such as crayfish and basically we talk about how we can interpret that knowledge into catching more carp. So if you're a little bit geeky and you like the ins and outs of watercraft and carp, this is definitely for you. Ben, for those of you who don't know, owns BP Milling, who make feed for commercial fisheries, as well as anglers wanting to give the fish the very best food available. He also is a fish farmer. Uh, he studies at Sparshall. Super interesting dude and someone who you should most definitely listen to. Before we jump into the episode, of course, as always, we are sponsored by carphuntergiveaways.co.uk. Awesome company, fantastic giveaways. If you haven't checked these guys out, you really are missing out. They do prize draws for pretty much everything that you can think of, and they do a prize draw every single day of the week at 7.30 p.m. live on Facebook. Get involved. It's it's an enjoyable experience. At least once a week, I'll enter a prize draw, sit down, have a beer, watch the live draw, and it's a, it's a nice, fun thing to do, and there's lots of prizes that are being won as well. So go ahead, check those out, cuphuntergiveaways.co.uk. Lastly, before we jump into the episode, you need to go and check out our website if you're at all interested in our hook baits that have been a long time coming. We've got four different flavors. Flavors doesn't really do it justice because there's so much more to these hook baits than just flavor. Um, but we've got four varieties, let's say, in the range, and they are selling out pretty damn fast, even on the pre sale. So if you're interested in getting your hands, on some of our hook baits, go on over to carpchronicles.com. Check them out. We've got a special deal where you can get all four pots for £48. So, bit of a bargain. They're very special hook baits. I'm sure we'll chat about them at some time, uh, but they're going to catch a lot of fish this year. So, go ahead, check them out. Carpchronicles.com. That's it for the intros. Jump into the episode. I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoy recording it. Absolutely love chatting to Ben. Wealth of information. Sit back, grab yourself a drink, and soak in the knowledge that Ben shares with us. Ben, it's been a while since we've had you on. Almost a year. I think it was beginning of March when we last recorded it. What's been going on in your world of angling since then? Have you been fishing much? Um, typically, the, my favourite time to go would be in the spring, but that's um, the spring is obviously when the business is is flying. Then, so it just goes from almost from zero to uh, to absolutely flat out. Because obviously, everyone that wants their fish feed is wants to stock up for the um, for the summer for the growing season. So that's normally the springtime that they'll stock up. So yeah, that it peaks sort of. Um, April, March, April usually, but last year we were um, we were still bloody cold in May last year, so mm-hmm. um, sort of lost a month of sales there. And uh, last year being the first year, it's Brexit and all that sort of um, that sort of we had to stop exporting um, just through. I, I used to sort of have between fifty and hundred ton would go uh, across Europe uh, most of the. Most of the year, we'd have to have a trickle going over there, but with Brexit, it's just put a lot of barriers at the border and a lot of um, a lot of obstacles there. And even at the best of times, exporting to France was um, you'd you'd get drivers which typically uh, when they see us, if I'm convinced, if they see us an English pallet, they'll uh, make half an ass attempt at delivering it, and then they know that they can charge you double for reattempting. So uh, I was having quite a few consignments go over there, which. Uh, They'd fail on delivery. I'd be charged twice for a re-delivery, and it would just takes all the money out of the job. So it's um, so I wasn't too disheartened about stopping the export to France, but it was a lot of business, a lot of tonnage we were sending over there, and it was growing all the time, and the feedback was really good in France. So um, yeah, a bit of a shame there, but I'm hoping in time that the uh, restrictions will start to settle and it will become a lot more possible to well, more streamlined if anything to get it across there because the paperwork just seems so clunky and the systems they got in place. But yeah, that's uh, one one change we've had in the last twelve months, I think. Um, and yeah, we've had last year was our first year. I'm sure we mentioned it in the podcast. Uh, liquid product we were making um, for feed coating. Um, we've been been asked for a long time. I'm sure it's in the previous podcast, but I'll talk about it anyway. The um, 
the use of garlic in feeds and the um, and how uh, garlic has got a good reputation for repelling skin parasites and uh, it's used in equine industry and and in uh, a lot of animal feeds for uh, repelling biting insects um, fleas and, and mus- midges and you know mosquitoes stuff like that um, and it's, it tended to sort of be aligned align with um, the aquarium industry for using garlic to repel skin parasites like argillus, fish lice or um, and leech so yeah I sort of dismissed it for a long time thinking that um, it was a load of nonsense but uh, and carried on uh, I was busy enough with, with the feeds I was making until yeah the lockdown came uh, the first lockdown and I, I thought oh, I've got a bit of time I'll, I'll have a play around and see what's on what's around and do a bit of research into it and um yeah, my research kept showing that um, there was a, uh, a sulfur-containing compound in garlic, which is what's doing the repelling, but it's heat-sensitive, so a lot of the people that were asking me to put garlic into the pellets, I couldn't do it because the cooking process of the, the uh, and the heat generated in the pelleting processes <coughs> is going to denature the, the sulfur, and the, the, it's, it's not going to have the same effect because, it, because it's a heat-sensitive uh, compound that we needed to protect, so I I still went back to thinking how it could be done and whether I could powder coat the pellets or something, but then it would wash off. So then I spoke to a few manufacturers and uh, uh, was in through the food industry really um, and, and finding uh, a liquid product that was um, processed in a way that there was no heat used to denature, the to protect the sulfur compound, the alicin. Um, and yeah, we came up with a product which we, we've um, combined with an oil to, to carry the, that that um, that alicin into the pellets, so that our pellets absorb oil really well. So um, we've done, we've made like a liquid product which is applied post production. So your pellets would just be coated um, in this oil, and they take on that alicin, and and uh, in theory it should repel the parasites. So yeah, it was all a bit of an ex- experiment, uh, a bit of an experiment last year, but the feedback has been honestly incredible. Like the uh, I know I'm going to say it because I'm biased and it's a product that I've made, but it's actually been like incredible. Like the people, everyone that's used it has said how the fish have responded to it. Um, even in my ponds, I noticed straight away how they respond like instantly to the food. Like normally, if I, without the the what we call natural power, this product we've made, um, we if I fed the ponds their ration without the, the feed, they'd sort of gently fizz over 24 hours, and you you go down there 24 hours later, and they'd still be gently feeding away. But with this Naturopel on it, they're they're literally on it, and you know, in within sort of an hour, they've just just really sort of bubbling up and uh, going bananas, and it's aligned with all the feedback as well. That everyone's saying that they have got a lot of fish showing over it, and uh, as a result, um, come the sort of winter time when parasites tend to sort of accumulate through the summer, um, people are saying that their fish have been the cleanest they've ever seen. In fact, I had one customer say that um, they've been advised by the EA to do this, that, and the other with pipes. Where, where the argulus, the fish lice, lay their eggs on a hard substrate, the EA will advise you to um, to put in these, these drainage pipes. So um, the argulus lay their eggs on the drainage pipes, which is hard, hard plastic, and then uh, you take these drainage pipes out and spin them around so the eggs that have been laid on the pipe are left out of the water to dry. Then the other end of the pipe is put in for them to hatch the next batch of argulus, which is a way of controlling them by drying the eggs out. And... Uh, that sort of cycle and then we had yeah a lot of people saying they've been doing that for years and it's kind of controlled them but Naturopel has eradicated them so uh yeah couldn't be happier with that product it's uh, been immense um, In- interesting yeah want to talk to you about the garlic a little bit more yeah. and the products that you use what that was a good intro but what about your fishing dude your personal Sorry. fishing <laughs> um uh yeah so what have i done um the spring oh yeah i did try to do quite a bit in the spring before it got too warm um because obviously the orders as soon as it's all temperature dependent my orders so uh, i got out early spring because it was still cold wasn't it in april and may yeah um then i was at the syndicate and uh i couldn't have caught less caught less fish to be honest <laughs> um they're all the syndicate that i'm on they've got like a, a shallow bay which they tend to sort of as soon as it warms up the predominant like the majority of the stock will go into the shallower bays and that was pretty stitched with anglers and i don't like to sort of slot in and going mm. after somebody else so I like to sort of try and create some of my own somewhere else but that just wasn't happening I was you know baiting and trying to keep a few bots the spots uh, get a few spots going but uh, in the spring it's hard anyway because they don't think you know they're just coming onto the food they're not really got a, 
um, a huge metabolism or much of an appetite. So, um, so yeah, it was a bit of a losing battle and got a bit, uh, a bit frustrating to be honest, because there's a lot of fish being caught right in the areas that were, you know, people were camping in there and um, they were catching fish. So yeah, I was trying to do my own thing and was getting there, couldn't really get close to them. Um, so then, yeah, I got busy after that with with orders and sort of put my kit away in a bit of a strop, thinking, oh, bloody hell, I can't catch a thing. And, uh, yeah, I went um, through the summer. I went to walk around the lake, which I'd stocked, which I think was in the previous podcast as well. I just stocked a lake in the water park, donated some fish to an angling club. And um, I walked around there in the summer um, to see if I could see any, see how they're getting on, check they're all sort of settled in. See, it was a hot day, so I might see a few basking. And uh, all I saw was massive fish, like... Um, I knew there was a lot of big fish in there anyway. Well, a few big fish. And I saw a handful of them. And yeah, the, the smallest one must have been mid-30. So um, it sort of got me got me wanting to go again. So I uh, started baiting that in the summer. And um, it's very low stock. Um, speaking to a few of the people that do fish it, they reckon that there might be sort of between 15 or 20 fish in there. Um, with the I put 25 in there. Um, so a total stock would say 45 but the fish I put in were only sort of mid doubles they see fours um, and yeah I, I was reluctant to go at first because I didn't want to be catching the fish I'd just put in in the winter I thought it would be look, look a bit daft me going to catch my fish that I've only just put in but yeah these big ones um, it was hard not to to be honest so uh, started baiting and um, straight away started to catch I think four or five of mine um, and I just kept baiting and uh, I heard of a couple that were coming out and um, they were all big fish, nothing smaller than 30. And eventually, yeah, in the, in the autumn, um, my angling sort of comes and goes with, with sort of business, gets busy and I um, I try and work out a window of when I think I'll be able to go and then bait up sort of a week or two in advance to try and maximise that window if I, if I got a chance to go. So yeah, I've um, the, my next opportunity was sort of the autumn really. Um, the time I actually took it seriously again and um, started baiting again. Um, and I think it was my first session after baiting. After I think it was a good couple of weeks baiting every night, putting a lot of food in as well. Um, probably as much as ten kilos a night, um, which was my pellet and boilie. Um, and then I got to yeah a chance to fish it and I had one straight away so as the light was getting dark it took me a few hours since setting up and uh, it was a 43 um, nice, nice chunky old fish um, and yeah that uh, that was I thought here we go went again the, after the next night so I sort of I normally just fish the nights and go back to work in the mornings and get some stuff done and then get back to the lake as soon as I can um, and the next night I blanked and then I don't think I got another chance to go then that was literally the last chance and I started to vlog my sessions um, leading up to that like with the baiting and things and trying to get a vlog going for some content um, and yeah I thought brilliant this is working out really well I caught a couple of my fish shows a bit of a story there of how they're growing since they've been stocked and then uh, I caught this big one as well and it was all going really well but then I uh, didn't get a chance then it got busy with uh, with orders again and um yeah, I just didn't find another window to go, but that was a success anyway. I didn't regret that. It was a uh, yeah, a good bit of fun. But um, there's a lot of crayfish in there, um, so yeah, I wasn't scared to put the food in, um, knowing that the crayfish are going to eat the, the majority of what I was putting in. But if I could create areas where where they were, you know, polished and something something of interest to the carp, because the carp are they're not very pressured at all. It's a park lake, and I thought anywhere, any sort of spot quiet little areas that you can get the fish interested in and you know if there's a lot of crayfish turning over the substrate then that might be an area that the fish recognize as a you know an area of interest they might keep going back to and I just had that in my mind just keep going I know the crayfish are eating a lot of it but I'm just gonna keep going anyway and ignore it and uh, yeah fishing with plastics um, and yeah hopefully I sort of plan on doing the same thing this year I don't know if I'll um, fish so much the syndicate now I've sort of had one of the better ones of the this park lake I know there's some that are not bigger than the one I had as well so I'd like to keep going there um I prefer sort of fishing for one or two fish a year than um going somewhere for bites really but yeah that's that's the idea hopefully this year I'll get a chance to do something similar but we'll see yeah, but. nice mate yeah <clears throat> I mean 
do you find just to go off on a tangent about the the crayfish thing mm. we would both fish up on the water park mm. Cotswold water park obviously cray is just an issue everywhere yeah. do you do you do this pretty much the same thing as the rest of us or do you have obviously with your background of fish science and aquaculture science do you have any little nifty nifty tricks for us um i was told by somebody after doing these uh garlic products somebody mentioned that garlic uh that crayfish don't like garlic um so, so yeah the, the one of the ingredients we use for naturopel I, i've got like the the neat extract of the the, the garlic the, um, that we use for that and uh, i was soaking my hook baits in that um and that that was i was surprised but yeah it was um it was still getting hammered by crayfish but i think where there's such a problem at that in the lakes that we're talking about um i don't know i don't think there's anything that like, people say that they they prefer fish meal to anything sweeter but i i can't i think they'll have what you chuck at them to be honest yeah. but it, when they're in those levels maybe if they're then you know not quite so established they they might pick and choose a little bit more but i think where we're talking about this they're so rife that yeah anything that goes in they tend to hammer it but i think any activity and i think the fish will pick up on sounds like that as well i think um so when fish are feeding i, I, I think we take it for granted a bit but what you can hear underwater when you you know when you're swimming i think the fish would pick up on sounds like that through their swim bladder that's you know connected to their internal ear they can they can hear crunching and and any movement and i think any sort of uh interesting areas you can create i think the crayfish will help you in that respect yeah um, <clears throat> and yeah it's another reason why i don't lose too much sleep about crayfish or silvers eating the predominant you know, majority of what i'm putting in i think just creating areas where you're going to get fish to show an interest i think um if you've got a bit of plastic left there when one turns up you might get a bite but um i wouldn't know how else to approach lakes where you've got so many crayfish that they are putting in they're, they're having everything you put in because i think that does put off, a lot of people off putting any food in um because they know they're just going to be feeding crayfish um it's a necessary evil though isn't it yeah that's right yeah so i think you've you've just got to go with it i think um a lot of the ingredients are soluble enough to to leave something in the area that's uh, going to scream a bit of food for for fish. I, I, yeah, I don't know. So sort of, that's the way I kept sort of encouraging myself to keep going. Was, was telling myself that to. Uh... Yeah, I mean, from a traction point of view, if if the crayfish are obviously turning over the bait, you know, chewing it up, it's going to be releasing, like you say, the solubles, mm. the amino acids, organic acids mm. into the water column, isn't it? I'm sure crayfish make a noise when. I'm sure you've seen loads of crayfish on a on a spot in the yeah. edge. There's a lot of them. Carp yeah. must be able to hear that happening as well. So I, yeah. I always think, if anything, that's that's probably aiding your attraction to a point. Yeah. Obviously, the downside is you've got to keep your fucking hook bait in, in yeah. check. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's um, yeah, it's been it's been good fun. It's sort of you, you reel it in, and all the, all the rig components be battered. And uh, but yeah, it's, I enjoyed it. It's sort of part of the challenge and. Uh, but yeah, like you say, I think think having anything that's going to create any sort of disturbance like that, and the fish, any juvenile crayfish that you know as they hatch, I'm sure that's a, I'm sure the fish enjoy eating them as well when they're softer and uh, when they lose their shells as yeah. well. There's that like few yeah. week period, isn't there, where they they yeah. they're nice and kind of jelly soft for the carp. I think that's yeah, yeah, it can yeah, be hard fishing. Um, yeah, it was a yeah, big weedy lake. It was um, hard to sort of have anything else to to go on really. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I no, enjoyed it. I'm hopefully get back and have another one or two uh, yeah. later in the year. But I think when we last did our podcast, <clears throat> you're on a different syndicate, yeah. lower down in the water park. Yeah, you... that's the one I was talking about where it was stitched uh... up. Fished well in the spring. Um, funny enough, it didn't fish very well after the spring. Um, I think it, it did do some big fish, but but very hard for going. I think um, I think everywhere seemed to suffer with weed middle middle of the summer. There's a lot of weed in a lot of the venues I was visiting, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it was just one of them years where it, it we sort of really did uh, get well established, and this particularly the one I was fishing as well. And um, there was times when I went up there, and there's massive rafts of weed which had like uh, floated over the areas I was baiting, which uh, made it a bit bit, bit interesting. Um, but yeah, no, that's it really for my fishing this year. I seem to do less and less, to be fair. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> every uh, every year, but. Um, I don't know, the syndicate is uh, going in the right direction. Um, so I think uh, later later on, later on I'll uh, go back there and spend a bit of time, I think. It's good to have somewhere local that 
if one one of them's too busy, you can go on the other. But on the other one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that's all right. Nice. The the other well, there's two more. So with you, is there's going to be loads of tangents, but there's yep. two things of what you said I wanted to pick up on. Definitely want to go in more depth about the garlic. Um, but also, you mentioned the forty three something like that mm-hmm. that you caught. Was that the one that we were talking about earlier, sort of off air? with the bulge at the side, quote-unquote broken rib. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Do you want to tell everyone what you were telling me? Because it, I've learned something. I didn't realise this. Yeah, okay. Um, there's So, yeah, the, the, the fish you're talking about, I've caught one, that one from the, the water park that I mentioned, the 43-pound, that had uh, a sore on one side, a real sort of um, a lesion on one side, a, a real big red sore. Um, and this is sort of, uh, you see it quite a lot, and, in certain batches of fish um and a lot of people that see them put it down to a broken rib which would make sense i suppose it would look similar to that if, if a fish had popped a bone and a bone was you know protruding through the side of the fish um and uh yeah it's it's, it's not that it's uh actually a, the swim bladder where the, where these fish uh, are produced um so certain fish farmers that might select fish for you know not necessarily that the angling market it might be um a business point from a business point of view really when they grade fish from um from batches where they want so obviously fish farmers are paid by the weight of fish so that they'll grade um the, the fish farm here that we're talking of is would, would grade the chunkiest fish the heaviest fish that are put on the, the most weight as soon as possible because obviously they're being paid by the weight um so they'll grade fish that are chunkier shorter you know deeper fatter um, and as they bred from them and used them as brood fish, these fish were getting shorter and shorter. Like the, the skeletal structure of the fish was was um, were getting shorter, but the the swim bladder was you know trying to sort of uh, is an elongated organ really that the, the sort of gas chamber in the fish that regulates the buoyancy and the how the fish you know regulate their buoyancy. So um, this uh, the swim bladder was was almost going on, curling on a bit of a you know off, off one to the one side. So the swim bladder's putting more pressure on one side of the fish and uh, pushing through the muscle tissue and, and creating a lump on one side. And you can imagine a fish is a, a streamlined, they're designed to be streamlined to slip through the water as efficiently as possible. But if they've got a protrusion and, you know, a, a lump on one side, then they're naturally going to, uh, that's going to be something that sticks out that's going to be get more abrasion on that lump. And uh, that's where they develop a sore, um, which I'm sure if you, a lot of, people listening to this would have seen the uh the, the type of thing we're talking about it becomes sort of a big circular lesion on one of the side the side of the fish which yeah is uh, it's actually the swim bladder where the brood fish have been selected um over you know generations to to be faster growing shorter fatter uh, i say faster growing the fish that put the weight on the quickest which um in in this in this circumstance it was a, a shorter brood fish uh, deeper brood fish yeah, yeah and it's that classic ugly old school simo kind of That's look right. that, that yeah. most carp anglers don't like and yeah. it's basically just because they've got their their skeleton so short they're just cr- trying to cram everything yeah. into a short area much, yeah. so i know some people will be thinking well hang on like surely you want the longer fish mm. they they've got more potential to put on weight presumably yeah. though it's just it, it's quicker for them to build fat than it yeah. is actual length and and girth from from, so, from yeah, size. You, if you think from a business point of view, if you're growing carp to sell on, you're being paid by the weight. So if I buy a load of one pound fish and I'm I'm going to sell them next year, um, I want them to put I'm, I'm going to sell them by the weight rather than the number of fish. Then uh, I want them to put on as much weight as possible. This is from a business point of view rather than an ethical sort of uh, viewpoint, if you like. Um, <coughs> then it's cheaper to feed them a fat diet because obviously fat is going to equate to weight gain. Um, than it is a high protein diet so it's if you want that fish to you're going to be put on more fat weight rather than muscle weight on that fish by feeding a high fat diet and high protein diet it's uh, going to put more weight on but it's yeah a compromise to the skeletal structure sometimes um, and if you take that over generations of grading those brood fish for that reason the, the fish that best convert uh, their diet into body weight or best metabolize fat then uh, you're going to slowly develop fatter fish with a different skeletal structure, but you still got this um, this uh, what was it called the uh, the organ uh, what was it the swim bladder sorry couldn't think of the word then um, you still got the swim uh, swim bladder which needs to support that body weight which needs to have enough um, it needs to be enough of a 
capacity to to float that fish and, and uh, regulate its, its buoyancy. So. And, and presumably, <clears throat> the fish that do have this, it looks like a boil or a spot, doesn't it? Yeah. The bigger they get, I'm guessing the bigger that's going to get because they need a bigger swim bladder to regulate the extra weight through the water yeah. column. So that a fish would be able to deal with that pretty well. If a healthy fish would be able to... Um, yeah. It's, if it's got a good immune system and it's, it's not stressed, it can deal with it and they can grow on and be, be healthy, but they do carry a, a scar and... Often it'll be a big red or black lesion on one side. Um, but yeah, healthy fish will be able to cope with that. But if that fish went through a, a period of stress for a long time, then that infection, that red sore, could you know overwhelm the fish, um, which is something I've just been talking about in a video I edited this morning, which is uh, about you know keep your fish coming into the spring is the most vulnerable time for the fish because the bacteria respond to the change in water temperature much quicker than the fish's immune system so yeah. any open wounds like that um a bacterial infection could overwhelm the fish if it's not healthy if it's malnourished <coughs> or or you know stressed then that could be a site of infection where bacteria as they grow in the spring as bacteria become more active that could uh, be a site of infection which if the fish is not if it's the fish's natural defense defenses aren't uh fueled well enough or if the fish is stressed then that could yeah overwhelm and kill the fish but but most of these you know these these big ones that grow to that sort of size they've they've grown that big because they are low stress they're not you know they're, they're healthy fish anyway so but if you put that fish into a match environment where there's more stress more bacteria as the water temperature increases that that is a real threat to the to the fish's life um but yeah they, you do see a lot of them they don't see so much nowadays because i think angling's become sort of gone to the other way where we all prefer a longer scalier fish now mm. um and those are sort of the old school simos if you like that um, yeah that, yeah i think they are because it's gone so far the other way i think it's quite it's seeing the odd one now it's like oh, a bit it's like yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. it's not pretty cool but yeah. um yeah no that was certainly uh certainly a character fish one i caught it's uh not one you take home to your mother it was no. a bruiser but uh, yeah yeah it's, uh, Perhaps we'll put a photo of it up. Yeah, yeah. You were mentioning um, garlic as well, and and I think you mentioned the word Allison a few yeah. times. Now that with garlic, if you, I think I'm right in saying this. I might be wrong. So don't you know? If you cut garlic on the side and then leave it for for five minutes, mm. I believe the Allison comes out, <clears throat> kind of like, is almost released from the ruptured cells right. from from cutting. Yeah. Um. What you mentioned the processing of, of this garlic liquid that mm. basically retains nutrients. It obviously heat isn't used in the, the formulation of it. Yeah. What is it a what it what is it that's denatured by heat? Is it the allicin? And what do you feel the allicin does within the bait in terms of the carp? Yeah, that's quite specialist for me. But that is uh, from what my research was, yeah, I think uh from what I sort of was reading up on, um the allicin was yeah heat sensitive, so you, you'd be denaturing and how how effective it is um, with the more heat you use. Um, and we don't use much heat in the in the, the pelleting process really. We just sort of it's just applied steam to the to the pellets, uh, to, and then through the the friction process of forming the pellet, there's quite a bit of heat generated there. But um, I didn't want to release something and find that oh this isn't working why not as you know i wanted to sort of go down the route of uh what my research had found out of it being heat sensitive so i thought right i ruled out heat straight away um so yeah i spoke to to a few um of the manufacturing suppliers that we use and trying to explain what i was trying to do and uh yeah they came up with some some processes that they use um to to extract that um sort of garlic extract um to to protect that that heat listen without without heat, sorry without uh, using heat um to, to yeah extract what they could to, to bind it with an oil um that we could apply to the pellets um but yes yeah, so as far as i'm aware it's uh and seen in my fish it's it's doing exactly the job that we we wanted it to do it's um but one of your podcasts you said to uh, one of the guys i picked up when you said that um like the un an onion would be like your perfect is that what you said? And one of the, the perfect sort of, <clears throat> I mean, the profile of an onion. I think be, um, Jason Ryder said onions. Yeah. Yeah. So the, it, it makes sense. It's part of that family that, you know, that I, I thought when, when I heard that from you, I thought, oh yeah, this does have some attractive properties to, to carp as I well. Th I think, uh, 
if it, if it was me that said it, it was because I went and looked at onion, the composure uh, of an right, onion. Right. Got lots of different organic acids in there. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's the perfect attractant for carp, but there's right. some interesting interesting yeah. organic acids in onions. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I, was, I, was just, I, know, I picked up on I thought oh, it's from the same sort of family at garlic. Onions, yeah. So well, J- Jason, there, but... Jason Ryder said about, I think he, I don't know whether he was on about onion powder or I think mm. he was on about just grating onion into method mix maybe. Right. Which was interesting. I've never done it. I've looked at onions. Um, yeah, for anyone listening, look at the um, organic acid content of an onion, and yeah. it, it, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. It's um, like a lot of people you get on are a lot more scientific than I am, and a lot more uh, advanced than than I am. I'm more of a in terms of, of view. in terms of the bait. Yeah, you're yeah, more carp just, science, yeah. right? But you, yes. but you don't you work with a animal nutritionist? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So that's sort of he, he comes from my back on a lot of things of, of what I basically go to him of what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. And then we'll uh, find a way of doing it. But yeah, all the technical side of the competition and the putting things together that's uh, more his back. Yeah. And I'm more yeah, yeah, yeah. On, like, yeah. That know the market very well and uh, yeah, yeah, that's where I come into it. But so, so the so you you might not be able to answer. No worries if not. But for the person listening they like the idea of, of this thing that's good for the, the fish's mm. health. You said yourself, the pellets that have got your garlic product mm. in outperform the the pellets without yeah, the garlic product. So what are they to use? Would you recommend garlic powder, which most of us have been using for, for got donkey's years, or yeah. would you, you know, you've got garlic essential oil as well. You've got garlic, you know, quote unquote emulsions available. Yeah. What, what would you steer people in the direction of? So for a, Parasite repelling point of view, the reason we've used it with an oil is not not just because to, to get it into the pellet itself and help the pellet absorb the oil um, and those compounds we want in there, um, but also to help permeate the skin of the fish to get through to the mucus to repel the parasite. So that having that as an oil base sort of uh, as a product is helping to do that, I think, because it goes through the intestine, it helps it sort of leach through and, uh, and permeate the skin. Do, yeah. Do you think... I'm just going off on a tangent here and, and quite possibly I'm wrong, but and I'm literally thinking on the spot, but do you think, because obviously carp, are const- their cells are constantly dying and be regenerated, same mm. as any any living animal, mm. us included. Do you think because, so the, the summit, there's a part of the cell called the myelin sheath, which mm. is made up of fat and it needs, it needs fat to be created. Yeah. Do you think there's something in that process as well that could help drive the garlic almost into the... <laughs> the the makeup of the flesh of the cart which would help repel yeah. the argulus or yeah a lot of the reading I was doing was uh, it was impermeating the skin trying to get those sulfur com- compounds to impermeate the skin and I thought the fat would be the best way to do it um, and yeah it's it, for, because because lice they're feeding off the mucus of the fish so that's what we're trying to repel so we want to determine it was going to get into the skin and the mucus um, and, and repel those those parasites so the, the argulus that we're talking about they are sort of a a problem in any well I say a problem that, that the fish can deal with them but the higher the number of parasite the of lice you're gonna you're gonna have the, an elevated um uh, irritation on the skin they're feeding off the mucus so the fish is having to to produce more mucus so they're using more energy to do that um so yeah if we can feeding them that natural power is gonna as they like say regenerate and, and produce that mucus I hope that some of the sulfur compound is uh, is carried through to, to repel those parasites um, and yeah the, the parasite needs to leave the host the parasite can't survive without a fish I think it's 10 days um, so yeah they, they leave the fish to, to lay their eggs and then once they've laid their eggs they'll find another fish to uh, to, to feed off of again so if that's our opportunity to um, intercept and try and uh, break the life cycle of the parasite if you like so um we're trying to repel these these uh lice and then as part of your management plan we encourage fisheries to remove refuge areas areas that fish gather to maybe recover or um hide you know, as a stress sort of relief area i don't know where, you know whether they've been caught and they might all congregate in a snag or a, or a reed bed that's those snags and reed beds are the the solid structure that the argulus want to lay their eggs where those the juvenile argulus when they hatch they're going to find it very easy to find another fish because that's the area that the fish like to sit and you know it's not going to be hard for 
a, a tiny little juvenile argillus to hatch and go and find a fish and the life cycle starts again and that's how the, the numbers of these argillus multiply and they do become an issue in, in certainly venues that we visit electrofishing and netting if you come up to a snag and you find a, a big ball of carp loads of carp coming up all in one go you'll find that they're covered in these argillus um, and argillus the eggs are very hardy so they can be laid the eggs can be laid through the winter and they, they can survive a whole winter without hatching and uh, they can be completely dormant through the winter and then in the spring they'll start to hatch so this is really the crucial time of year that we want um, to be feeding our fish natural powers because in the coming months um, these new the juvenile argillus eggs are going to be hatching so we want the fish out in open water where they're not going to be in areas easy for the for the uh, juvenile argillus to find them and uh, yeah we're just trying to break that life cycle of these this this hatch of parasites that are coming um, by encouraging fish to feed in open water taking out areas of refuge which some people think taking out areas of refuge is going to cause stress to the fish because the fish enjoy being in those areas it's a it's an area where they relieve their stress and they feel comfortable but our argument is you should have a fishery that where the fish can be stress-free anywhere in the lake so you want to create a stress-free environment for fish where you know we've all seen fish in open water just basking in the sun well that's really there that's the fish that's stress-free it's recovering it's re metabolizing its food that's perhaps eaten over the last 24 hours um, and it'll be converting that diet very efficiently doing that but by taking out those refuge areas we've put the fish in an area where they're not an easy target for parasites so mm. again breaking that life cycle of the parasite and by doing that you're relieving you're minimizing the skin irritation caused by these lice and uh, the, the issues that they cause obviously if, fish, if a fish is irritated by these lice um, they're going to be scratching jumping and potentially harming themselves on, on physical objects um, and opening up a wound which is a site for secondary infection obviously the fish is irritated the immune system is going to be suppressed so uh, it's easily a, a site for infection to take hold um, and that's yeah the whole reason for creating Natripel in the end is to, to combat that um, yeah but yeah it seems to be doing the doing the job at the minute but um, you, you mentioned um, like going to a warm site for, for the carp to digest food right <clears throat> so I wanted to talk to you about that just to switch gears slightly obviously this time of year you know as we record it is we're in the in the balls of winter yeah. um it's cold out there the water's cold there it's actually quite a wild mild winter obviously finding the warm slightly warmer temperatures of the lake just by a degree or two is is a can be a freaking game changer yeah. for winter fishing right in my experience tell me if i'm chatting shit you know please correct me but in my experience in the summer obviously it's more important in the winter i get that but in the summer the, the the different localized areas of the lake will fluctuate with water temp more mm. if you swim around a lake yeah. in this in in spring or, or summer it's you you'll come going, yeah. yeah you'll come to an area and it's like oh shit this is a lot warmer or a lot colder yeah how important is it and are we missing a trick by not paying more attention to water temperature in the summer yeah i think it's i think it's hard to locate areas unless you've got a big weed bed obviously that's going to be a big dark um a bed that's going to is they tend to absorb the heat very well so you'll get the upper layers of a weed bed that are very warm and the lower layers that are very cold and shaded um so that's an obvious one which is obviously going to be warm and i tend to find with my fish in when it's like that when it's roasting hot and the fish are looking for those warmer areas then a big floating weed bed a raft that's floating around the lake the fish want to be sat in that so yeah fishing just off of that um it's yeah you and again, my experience of electrofishing fishing, when we've had to do a fish rescue in the summer, um, you might find, you always tend to find if there's a floating raft of weed, that um, you will find fish underneath mm. it or, or amongst it um, in that real sort of warmth. Um, it just absorbs the heat in there and, and they like to be in there. But it's harder, like you say, when you're swimming around a lake, it's harder to predict which spots are going to be warmer than others. Um, and that's another reason why having... Um, I think the stocking density uh, is is has plays in that sort of um, what we're talking about is having more fish um, helps to mix those layers. So from a fishery management point of view, there's a balance of having not enough fish and too many, whereas there's a nice sort of medium in the middle where you've it's shallower lakes uh, and having the right amount of fish in there, you can keep that water mixing. So I think mm. the mixing of water is important. J literally just from the fish swimming around. Yeah. So Incredible. if you've got uh, a shallower lake 
is easier to do that obviously because the one big fish can move a lot of water as it swims around um so that's why i think shallower lakes tend to be more productive is because the you get more water mixing whereas in deeper lakes you get more layers when i think fish that it's like me if you swim around in a lake you'll, you'll know about these these layers you bump into a warm patch you think, well, that's lovely and you go into a cold bit and uh i think yeah anything like that is to us we take for granted because warm-blooded but as a, as a carp being a cold-blooded a animal game changer right? Yeah, yeah so um i think yeah it's having that getting that balance right in your uh stocking density to have enough fish to mix that water is uh really does have a big impact on the progression of those fish but uh, again if you having not enough fish you might get layers of water like that and you'll get a lot of weed growth which again encourages these warmer areas of water whereas if you have the stocking density too high obviously the fish aren't going to grow anyway because there's too many that the, the, they're exhausted the natural food that put the water's turbid so there's an element of nutrition to the water so i'd definitely rather have too many fish because i know i can control them and, and take a few out and not have enough um in there um so yeah there's, there is that balance of and I'd, I'd normally go off sort of the clarity of the water but yeah again uh, shallow water is anywhere we go where there's shallow water we tend to find big fish where uh, hmm. obviously the water warms up you get better water mixing um and yeah having those fish that little bit closer to the lake bed where they can disturb it every time they waft their tail they're disturbing the substrate and getting those uh yeah. the organic material breaking down it's a nutrient it's more nutrient rich and they just tend to grow much bigger in the uh, shallow waters like that yeah um but yeah it's an interesting thing i'd like to do a bit more on uh, uh testing the, the the layers of water and and perhaps having i did think about this the other day of having sort of a probe with temperature uh <coughs> probes all the way up the stick to find ah, out yeah. how fluctuated they are in different lakes and yeah different bits like this is something i did different bit of research that i don't think has been covered quite quite so black and white like that that we could uh yeah i'd like to be involved in things like that to see what yeah what comes of that. yeah as a fish farmer do you think, and obviously someone, I mean, you started at Sparshot, you obviously got feed company, you know, you're very enthralled in, mm. in that side of angling. Do you think there's a lot that actually we don't really know regarding the, the watercraft in general of carp um, fishing? Do you think a lot of it's like a little bit of an un unknown territory or, or do you think uh, it's all pretty well mapped out? No, I think a bit of both. I think there's, uh, from my experience, I find that, it's quite um, sobering, really, but I listen to some of the the most reputable names in the industry that you know that you couldn't come close to knowing as much as them. But even they say things that I disagree with, and what I might have seen examples of that, that goes against what they're saying. And, and I'm I always go in with an open mind. I don't always, you know, I, I try and make things on my how they're my opinion rather than uh, uh, just accepting that they're gospel. I, I always go in with an open mind, but. You can't ignore the things that you see every day and um, every fisher we go to and we see the exact same patterns. I think that, that convinces me more and more, although I, I don't like to concrete my thoughts too much. Um, uh, I, yeah, I still hear people coming up with these theories and, and, and advice that I can categorically disagree with because what I've seen and experienced time and time again but yeah that to me that that i find it sobering that these people that you really do look up to and you, you, you have so much respect for them but you can see them getting it wrong i do think that yeah i mean it does probably to answer your question it probably uh there is probably more to be uh discovered that that we might be um taken for you know we assume it's a rule but you know we haven't okay. quite uncovered it all but let, let's throw some people under the bus who are you, <laughs> I'm joking. you don't have to say who but what what are some of the the things that you hear get gets kind of spoken as as gospel that you you disagree with um well straight away there's um obviously my f all i do is is cereal pellets for feeding to fisheries and you hear it time and time again people that um uh you know the fish meal is the way to go you're not going to get um any growth out of cereals because at the end of the day fish meal is is researched to be the best you know it's obviously the the most digestible protein to fish that it's easily converted into protein yeah. into uh into body weight um can't argue with that but feeding our fish on cereals and a fast breakdown pellet is going completely against the industry of you know extruded diets that are fed to intensively farmed fish um you know you can't you can't beat the r d that goes into them but um i've been feeding for my carp on my cereal feeds for 10 years now and uh well, as an example, my C2s this year are the biggest I've seen 
in any of the fish farmers across the country. I think that they're, they're competing in size to any fish farm, and they've all, all just been fed as my feeds. And my, I try and direct people down the route of farming fish outdoors. It's more about their environment. It's like having a cow in a field. You can overgraze the field, and then there's you need to feed them something once the grass is gone. Um, and some fit, you know, at the right time of year, that grass might keep up keep with the the density of animals you've got in the field. And other times, the fish will over, the, the the animals will overfeed, overgraze it, and there's no food. You need to supplement it with something, mm. and you need to keep them happy. So there's more to it than just feeding them this or that. It's uh, about creating a fertile environment, happy fish. Um, that's the way I sort of try and spin it and into uh, into yeah, like I say, the, the fish meal side of things. I've got fish. Fish are most nutritionally dependent in their first few weeks and months of, of their lives. Well, I've got fish in my ponds that last year had first year carp that reached six to eight inches in their first year, and they wouldn't have reached that if they were even lacking one vitamin or mineral. They would have de- developed deformities or abnormalities, or their growth would be compromised from not having those vitamins and mineral- minerals in their first stages of their lives. So that, to me, is confirmation that the fish are getting their essential vitamins and minerals that they need to develop healthily. Um, and that, that batch has become my biggest C2 carp, um, which, yeah, very excited about seeing them. Um, so it, like, when, when it comes to growth, everyone's obviously on about amino acids, or everyone's on about protein, okay, how much protein or fish meal protein is better. Um, but obviously there's more to it than that. There's, there's calories as well, mm-hmm. there, and there's fat and there's carbohydrates and obviously other nutrients. So you say that um, that your recent um, year of fish, however you'd t- you know whatever terminology you'd use, you say that they've grown better in that year than say other fish farmers. Yeah. Um, do you feel that there's a difference in carrot? So so maybe I'm just playing devil's advocate here, mm-hmm. right? Let's say they were here and they were saying, well, actually, we're feeding it a more complete protein source, better amino acids. So ours should be growing more. Would you retort and say, well, look, mine have grown more than yours, actually. Would you then add on to that? Maybe you're feeding more calories or more certain macronutrients or um, micronutrients. Is there, is there that there's, that's well, helping? Or? T- t- the, the feeds that are nutritionally complete diets, extruded feeds, um, they're developed for sort of, you know, intensive aquaculture. So indoor recirculation systems where... It, that my feeds would do crap in an indoor environment because in an indoor environment you've got a filter which is taken out it's preventing an al- any sort of algae development it's, it's preventing any sort of nutrient value to the water because it's, it's being filtered so um all the all the nutrients need to be provided in that that diet in that package of the pellet it needs to be providing all the essential vitamins and minerals for that fish um so the non-essential vitamins and minerals the fish can can produce their cells um, but the essentials need to be in that diet um, and you can feed them extensively in those indoor systems because you've got the biological filters which are removing the ammonia produced by the excess of protein so if you've got uh, you you know like I say that, that, that natural filter you haven't got that in a lake so you need to protect the environment because we haven't got a biofilter in a lake you've got an organic sort of nitrification cycle which which we need to sort of uh, I think you can do a lot on your management to optimize the nitrification cycle and that nitrification cycle is is producing nutrient which is soluble for for a food chain which you haven't got a food chain in an in in, in an indoor intensive system so uh from a fishery point of view outdoors it's a completely different ecosystem um so for me you've got protein content in you know daphnia and in algae and the, the, the plankton and the food chain that comes from that so it's really about optimizing the environment and the, the food available naturally to the fish outdoors and i think you can go further with pellets that break down like mine because they break down you get an oxygen through the mix which is breaking it down organically and feeding that food chain and getting these fish to root at the bottom so, so my feed breaking down fast you'll you'll get a longer fe- uh, feeding period so they'll feed much longer grazing the, the substrate and the more you can encourage these fish to graze that substrate the more you're going to disturb the bottom and combat silt and and the the breakdown of, of that silt into nutrient that's feeding that food chain and that's for me is all about feeding that food chain getting a fertile productive environment 
and then that food that you're putting in is also going to be being eaten for fish so you're, you're supplementing their diet they've got food that, and they're feeding on cereals in a nutrient-rich environment with a thriving food chain i think that's where we get our growth from is it's through not through what you're putting through the fish's gut it's more what you're putting around the fish and the food chain you're encouraging and uh feeding so um the environment you're creating as a result of the the feed type yeah so yeah. the 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 other side of that the extruded diets that don't break down the argument there is the people that wouldn't like my pellets and don't like my pellets they say that it breaks down too fast so the fish can't get it through them they say it goes to waste um whereas in a pellet that doesn't break down the fish can physically get that pellet right through them through the intestine the whole package is going through that fish and the fish is absorbing it which is true um but you're not the fish will feed on that ration and once that pellet's gone or that those pellets that don't break down once they're gone there's no food content in the substrate anymore so they'll feed aggressively very quickly you would have seen on fish farms that feed extruded pellets they'll go bananas straight away as soon as the pellet goes in and then uh, the next feed isn't really coming to the well, you obviously will get an element of um a natural food chain the same as you would with my pellets but i think my pellets lend themselves better to enriching the environment and um and i think the growth rates are, you know it sounds impressive from what i'm saying and might be overcomplicating something but i think the growth rates we've had over the last 10 years sort of back that up that it's not stupid what we're saying and what we're doing is uh is working and i've not fed a single fish mill pellet for uh, 10 years and i've got c5s and sixes that have as big as anyone else's so if there's anything they were lacking, then over six years it would show quite considerably. Over one year, you know, you might get a small um, change in growth rate, but over six years that would be quite, uh, you know, exaggerated then. So, essentially, you're you're rearing vegan fish. Yeah, I guess you could say so. Yeah, <laughs> it's right up Pete Street. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's gonna be uh, there's gonna be different aquatic life in the lake that they're eating, so that they're, they're obviously getting <clears throat> amino acids and things like that from yeah. from elsewhere, aren't they? But yeah. I appreciate the bulk of it is is from your feed. Yeah. So to to put that in terms for the angler, because obviously most of our listeners will, they, they won't be fish farmers or mm. sorry, they won't be lake owners. Mm -hmm. They'll be anglers. Would you would you recommend? sticking with let's say it's going to be uh, let me put it in in a in a situation that's that's relatable maybe right so i do a lot of stalking mm -hmm. for many many years i'd stalk with scretting pellet mm -hmm. i found that you know really hard to beat to be honest with you mm -hmm. it's different now you know yeah. nice oily trout pellet used to score very very well yeah for someone going about doing that they want to do a day stalking do you think there's a benefit to, to switching to a cereal based pellet like yours over something like a, a trout pellet like the spec of if you broke it down on paper the fish meal would be um yeah obviously much more attractive to fish um and it is i agree with you yeah you can i could feed my fish kept squat uh, squattings and coppins tomorrow and i'm sure they'd go crazy for it because uh it's an attraction profile it's, it's spot on it's, it's it is very good the fish like it um but again people will use my feeds for the first time and come back and say how how fantastically they've you know taken to that and uh, will show me pictures and video of the fish on it straight away um, but I think in an angling environment it's a bit of um, like my feeds tend to score quite well because you could smell my feeds and they're pretty odourless mm. it's just a cereal very bland cereal sort of not selling it very well here but it's uh, I think fish accept it because it's it doesn't scream bait or it doesn't scream you know it, might, it doesn't remind them of a scenario where they smelt that before and they went they through a period of trauma through capture I think it's yeah it's a very safe food signal that's um, pretty odourless so uh, I think yeah that from that point of view the, the, from an angling point of view that it tends to uh, have a bit of an edge from that that way because it is that's why I think particles are so good and and uh, things like corn obviously that they're, they're not you know, can't go into someone's swim and instantly go bloody hell what are you fishing with yeah because it's you know it's, it's pretty tame but um when you go i think angling is a lot of it is when you you can go into someone's swim and smell what they're using and you think mm. wow if i can smell that the fish must be uh pretty on edge in that sort of yeah in that environment but um but yeah for for, for my fish are fed it every day and i do find later in the season that they might be less um they might be less enthusiastic because they've been fed it all year and um that's why the natural power has been really good it's really sort of perked them up again 
Um, and I'm sure if I fed, because I've taken bait down there before where I've, at the end of a session just chuck a few boilies in, they do show to it quite well, but I think it's because it's something different and having a bit of a, a variation in their diet and, and they respond to it very well. But um, but in the spring, the cereals, you see the first few feet when it starts to warm up, they do yeah, really show um, quite enthusiastically over the, over the spot that I feed. Um, but I find later on in the season they're probably a little bit oh here we go again yeah there's some food there again. Mm. so mm. they graze over it for a lot longer um, over sort of 24 hours um, I can go down there if I, later in the sort of autumn time I could feed them in the morning and when I go down the next morning they're still fizzing gently over it so I like that that's what I want I want them to know that they can graze areas and, and find reward in the silt and find food items by grazing because that's how I want the fish to, to be I don't, I don't want them to you know, uh, pick off individual items and go. Oh, there's a bit of food. Sort that up. Chew through that. I want them to sort of hoover up and graze the substrate yeah. to keep that substrate active. And again, fertilise the uh, the uh, the natural environment. Um, so for me, that's the the bigger picture. For me, is the is feeding something that's going to uh, enrich the environment rather than enrich the fish when it's in the intestine. Uh, if that makes sense. But um, again, on the flip side as well, you've got in the summer that the you've got a uh, much lower water turnover obviously as it gets warmer and drier in the peak of the summer those proteins are being broken down very effectively by the fish but any excess protein is converted into ammonia which you've got no water turnover to do, dilute those pollutants you're creating so feeding something that's much more friendly on water quality like cereals is uh, much more um it's, it's, you're not compromising water quality so much through the summer because it's much much less harmful on water quality and the amount of contribution is much lower so um, that's the flip side is you've got the argument of yes all these fantastic proteins in a fish meal diet are very well absorbed but obviously the digestibility is all dependent on water temperature but the warmer the water temperature gets when the water temperature is an optimum for carp your water turnover is very very low um, so that's when you're I've, this is how it, how BP Millen basically started was because I was feeding Coppins and scratching, feeding the fish to appetite. Like, oh, this is easy. They're smashing it and just keep feeding them, and um, not knowing that through the season the acu- the ammonia was accumulating all through the season, low water turnover, very dry summer, uh, and ammonia were kept accumulating. And um, the, the the issues you get of ammonia are endless. Really, the fish, the fish yeah. stress and the problems they cause you is uh, yeah pretty uh, depressing when you catch it and you start seeing fish and the the what, what ammonia has done to the environment and the, the fish yeah I keep pond carp and tank carp so yeah it's it's a nightmare and you yeah. try to test all these high protein yeah. baits on them and it's obviously wreaks fucking havoc couldn't it so yeah I'm with yeah. you on that okay yeah. so then like in an intensive like I said earlier in an intensive system you're fine because the bio um, the bio filters are designed to, to remove that ammonia and mm-hmm. convert it into into nitrate that's uh, taken out by the filters so you're up in a lake environment you haven't got those filters so uh, you need to be very careful so yeah. finding cereals and going down the cereal route was a no-brainer for me and it's really this is a good sales pitch if someone listens to this it probably sounds like the way to go so it's, this is the battle <laughs> I've got with uh, with is to getting people to realise that cereals actually you the the growth you can get is, is um, comparable with fish mills if, if you go about your fishery management the right way um, yeah your fish definitely looking very healthy Mm -hmm. i think since our last podcast we spoke about or you had a theory i don't want to like kind of i know it's just a theory you haven't proven it or anything like that but you were saying about potentially the difference in um gut track lengths between fish that are reared on traditional fish meal type pellets compared to cereals yeah can you kind of touch on that expand on it yeah so like uh, if you looked at it from uh, like a predatory fish, the in- internal gut length would be much different to say a herbivore like a grass carp because meat. If a predatory fish is eating fish and, and, and meat from a fish, it's very easily converted into back into flesh for the fish and easily digested because it's fish into fish. Whereas a grass carp, a herbivore fish, um, the intestine, the gut length would be a lot longer to digest that and convert that and extract the nutrient from a um, say a veg- vegetable diet um, so that I think I think there could be um, an element of, of that in carp as well feeding the fish on a cereal diet which is harder to digest 
is the fish over a, a, a period of gener- over generations is the fish going to develop a slightly longer gut tract yeah. to to be able to cope with uh, these ingredients that are less digestible and on uh, the flip side of that if a fish is fed a diet which is very easily converted like a pellet which is designed to be easily digested an extruded fish meal pellet if it's uh, designed to be easily digested and easily converted into flesh for the carp is their inter- internal gut length effectively going to become lazy is their digestive system become, going to become lazy because it's easy to digest yeah um and I, this might happen over generations not in our lifetime but um i wonder if uh, if yeah over time how quickly that that changes um, <laughs> It's a, and that could be a real serious issue for these lakes that they're just reliant upon anglers' bait, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, I think probably the lakes that me and you fish, those fish are probably eating on a, a lot of different natural mm. um, food items as well, aren't they? Yeah. So, so they're probably, yeah. that's a bit of a saving grace for them. But yeah. certainly these lakes where it's like, I mean, you know better than I do, some of these lakes, they're just reliant upon the anglers' bait, aren't yeah, they? Yeah. They're overstocked, they're devo- therefore devoid of natural food. Yeah, and it's worse than that. Some, a lot of these places think they're doing a good thing by banning certain baits, and I think that's making anglers hesitant to use any bait at all. I think um, by protecting your water quality and telling anglers, you can't use this, that, 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 and that. And the worst thing is it's more commercial venues that are doing that with a higher stocking density, and the ones that are more at risk of... Uh, well, not a risk, may say the ones that are, have more malnourished fish, they tend to be the venues that are more um, active in banning baits. So it seems like uh, carp lakes are more sort of, they like to you to feed the fish and, and use bait, but places like commercial match venues that we go to, they ban this, that and the other, and you, you show them their fish and they're all malnourished. It's like, you shouldn't really, there's a lot of issues there, but um, one of them isn't bait, we don't think, obviously, the... Mm. the, the to an, to an extent, obviously, if you get people turning up bucket and stuff in on top of a commercial um, stock and density, then uh, you are going to get issues. But, but yeah, I think um, the places that I get people ring, ring up and I've spoke to people before said, oh, we don't need to feed our fish because uh, the anglers feed them. We get loads of anglers. Yeah, all right. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, my viewpoint is um, you would have seen up here, it's a, it's a family dairy farm, so it's all mm. very livestock orientated. Sorry, folks, we just lost power there. This is the joys of, of doing it in remote um, remote recording setting. Ben, just pick back up what, what you were saying there, dude, if you don't yes, mind. Yes, I think uh, where we were was something, uh, like you've been up here today and seen that we we're on a dairy farm. It's farming family that I'm from. And uh, we were talking about the management of uh, fisheries there. And um, if you had got my dad and my this is family family, so if you had my dad and my uncle and my grandfather in this room and told them that... Uh, there's businesses that I'm trying to encourage to feed their fish and they'd uh, they'd be pretty shocked that they don't already feed their livestock so it's yeah from this is the way I've my sort of approach into fishery management and the fishery industry is from a livestock point of view through being coming through a family of dairy farmers um, and generations of farmers um, understanding livestock and yeah to to realize when I came into the fishery industry that fishery managers as a practice don't feed their carp or don't feed their lakes uh, to me was uh, shocking so that was a, a to begin with that that was what started the business I suppose and started me promoting the idea was uh, to encourage fisheries that actually if you feed your fish you'll uh, here's the results you're going to see and uh, you'll have a much healthier fishery much healthier stock and much healthier business at the end of the day so um, yeah that was quite an eye opener at the beginning um, but I think it's been being more accepted now now um, more and more lakes are, are feeding their fisheries and realising what can be done and how much further you can take your stock. Um, and I like to think I've had some sort of uh, effect on that movement. But um, yeah, I know what you mean. But then you've got like the the, the classic iconic carp, like say the Black Mirror. Mm. Obviously, that was from a, a lake that's just you know enchanted in in mystery and all that stuff. No one's ever been feeding no. those fish, no. you know, not not from a commercial point of view. That obviously it was particularly for the time that was a very big yeah. fish, yeah. just just amazing for so many different reasons. You've got that side of it as well, mm. and like I would always, you know, I, I never fish for the black mirror, obviously, um, and I'm not saying that I'm, I, I'm not saying I'm going to have a, a chance of fishing for anything like that, but I would always gravitate towards that kind of water and that kind mm. of fish over somewhere, you know, to, just 
to put it in stark contrast somewhere that was like being fed daily and the yeah. timed pellet feeders that yeah. for a lot of anglers yeah yeah that, is is our idea of fucking hell yeah. so how do we strike a balance that's it so there's uh, like the black mirror used as an example there that that fish i think has got big because it's had a stress-free life it's it was a there's no fishing on that lake um so yeah it, it had a stress-free life of swimming about as very old fish so it got that big over a very long period of time and again something we see all the time in the angling industry and the, the venues we go to is everyone wants to recreate the red mire but the red mire is sort of the blueprint of how to how to you know get those fish to get big was they were put in those fish were originally put in at one pound from donald leaney so uh they were just left alone to do the job of clearing up the weeds. So obviously there was natural food and there was a, was a very rich lake. Um, and they, they, I think it was 50 one pound carp that went in initially. And nowadays you couldn't do that because obviously cormorants would nail them now. But um, And you need a fence around it to stop the otters. So it shows how things have changed very quickly since those days. But um, yeah, those fish got that big because they were left alone. They were undiscovered for years and years and years. They got big um, in, a, in a rich pond where they were just not stressed from predation or anglers um and nowadays it's not fish don't go under the radar so it's quite so easily because the industry industry's exploded anglers are everywhere up trees looking for carp and uh the carp don't get that sort of uh decades of going unknown and uncaught and uh, stress-free life and obviously you've got the the added predation issue of otters and cormorants that won't even let them get, cormorants won't let them get bigger than a pound Corm- uh, otters won't get let them get much bigger than uh, well they'll take anything and they so uh, yeah. they're up against it so those days I think are gone but then you've got people that want their, their fishery to be the next red mire but they go about it a completely different way so they stock different strains of fish they try this they try that whereas if you want to create the red mire you need, I think the best way to do it is to start with from literally like they did the small fish let them grow and um it's a long process and it's i think people get impatient when they they have a year where the fish haven't done so well they haven't grown or they'll try this they'll try that and they'll change too much and um a lot of the consultants i've been involved in one a good example on the farm we've got the nutritionist who uh, i use and has helped develop my feeds he, when he sees something happening on the farm he'll make very delicate changes to the ration or uh, anything that goes into the diets to the cattle on the farm it'll a lot, of, a lot of these consultants were going right. This is happening. The, 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 if the feeds go into them, through them too quickly, or certain parts of the diet aren't being digested, or the the manure of the cattle is being analysed, and there's things that are passing through the cattle without being absorbed, then a lot of people will make rational movements and knee-jerk reactions to change a lot in the diet. Whereas this consultant has come in and sort of changed tiny little things, and over the period of five or ten years, uh, the herd here is is you know really high high performance. Uh, herd here and this is the sort of thing that I like to implement into fisheries is, is to know what's healthy and uh, make subtle changes to manipulate the stocks and, and, and the fish to get them slowly getting in the right direction and unfortunately um, angling pressure is, is not the one if you want your carp to get big over a long period um, food is obviously a way of getting them big quickly um, and yeah, that's that's my way of looking at it, is trying to uh, show people how good livestock management really is. It's, um, it's, it's the same as parallel to any other livestock business, is uh, looking after your stock and their environment, keeping them stress-free, well-nourished. And uh, So yeah, there's, like you said, the there's two um, conflicting arguments there. As I'm the same as you, I like to fish lakes, which are low stock and untouched and very quiet and I wouldn't like it if somebody went out feeding the fish yeah. every day yeah. it seemed very commercial but then on the flip side if they are my fish then I'd be out there every day chucking food at them because <laughs> I know I want them to get big and I want the anglers to leave them alone and see, uh, see them get massive but, but but don't you want them to get big slowly so they've yeah. got the skeletal length and they're yeah. well proportioned and you know. yeah that's it that's the ideal but um, you to get the life out of those fish you've you've got to uh, run the gauntlet of um of a lot of issues with you know uh the the all the usual problems you get with fisheries and the management and the risks that you, you go to getting these fish that big um it can only take a one algal bloom or, or something an oxygen crash and yeah. being off the ball one summer and uh those those years are lost so yeah there's that argument um 
and a lot of the biggest fish I know locally um, are in lakes which are private and uh, no fish in or maybe there's a tiny syndicate that might be a couple of mates on there and uh, I don't think there's any coincidence in that I think yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's the, the anglers fortunately are uh, a stressing factor for, for like you say stress yeah. yeah big factor in longevity for yeah. for humans and animals isn't so, it yeah I'd say yeah that's why the black mirror got big was uh, though it did see quite a bit of pressure at the end of its life I suppose as people started to realise it um, was there um, but yeah it's interesting it's um, mm. two different ways of running your fishery and your business um, yeah. yeah and to link back two things that you were saying I mean those fish got big in Redmire from from eating the weed and all the mm. other aquatic life um, you're saying your some people say well your pellets don't smell so like mm-hmm. how is that attractive you know smell weed and, and smell yeah. um, you know smell the insects that the carpet yeah. they don't really smell of anything yeah, so all the tests that we've done the two like there's two compounds that are just by far more attractive than anything else right. neither of them smell no, of really. hardly anything at all <laughs> yeah, well, so it's is what we're smelling is just is, is totally irrelevant to, yeah. to what's attractive to the carp so and yeah. and you know proofs in the pudding somewhere like redmire you know that, yeah. that, that it didn't see bait those yeah. fish i mean you know clarissa and uh or ravioli as it as it was called previous mm-hmm. to that it got big not from anglers baits or anything no. like that it got big from odorless yeah. food that it ate a fucking lot of you know yeah yeah and that is uh We'd all love to recreate that, but um, yeah. that's yeah, sacrificing a lot of a lot of years and uh, leaving it alone for almost a lifetime to. Uh, and then when your anglers, you do let people fish it, it's almost like stopping those fish and yeah, and uh, going the other way. But um, yeah, that's that's an argument which um, I suppose yeah is is, is is two sides of that that argument with whether it's. Like I say, and it, if 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 they're my fish, I want to be feeding them to look after them. I'm from a farming family where livestock is uh, you've got to enjoy it and you've got to see your reward from watching them grow and yeah. uh, and flourish and, and do well. Um, and yeah, I appreciate. I wouldn't enjoy watching people feed the fish that I'm trying to catch. Yeah, but, um, yeah. No, a couple, yeah, couple more things we wanted to cover. To switch gears a little bit. Mm. Um, in terms of giving the fish something that's actually healthy for them, that's mm-hmm. going to enable them to thrive, this is something that we're working on with our uh, the bait side of our little business. Yeah. Is we're working on a product that that people can put in their their feed, their boilies, um, that'll basically help the cart repair, help them deal with the stress because it's stressful. Like mm. you know, we all love we love our quarry, but we're putting a hook in their mouth, mm. dragging them around a lake getting a photo with them, it's very stressful for them. Mm-hmm. And as well as that, of, of course, you know, carp just need different nutrients to, to thrive. We're trying to put something together that will help them thrive and help them deal with the stress of, mm-hmm. of capture. Yeah. For you, what, what, do you, what would you suggest is the right road to take with that? Do you have any designs for this, for BP milling in the future, where where um, would you go with that kind of thing? Smart mix. I went sort of on a similar route with that, trying to um, put in, put in yeasts in there to to strengthen the immune system and this this um, the the soluble the glutamate in there. That's the that's a soluble aquafeed yeast. It's been developed for aquaculture and um, it helps to boost immunity. Um, so I, I put that in there for that reason, and it was all formulated really to to um for the health of the fish there's a vitamin mineral package in there um really to appeal to those lakes like the commercials we were talking about that um are worried about what their fish are being fed i thought well maybe there's a market there for a diet which is actually ticks all the boxes for the fish um and those fisheries would be happy for that to be fed to the fish it breaks down fast it, it, it re- organically recycles very quickly so it's not going to be an issue for water quality as it breaks down and the fish are going to benefit from it nutritionally um so yeah, similar thing that I've done there. Um, but the biggest thing, really, re- being realistic, is in the anglers' hands of the way they handle them, and the on the bank really unhooking the fish. Um, this time of year in the winter, you find like that's the biggest thing in fishery management and fish husbandry is temperature. Really, um, I could handle fish on the bank for ten minutes and not cause that fish any harm in the winter below sort of. Uh, I don't know, but the cooler the better, really, below sort of 10 degrees, ideally. But the cooler the better. Um, but as it warms up, things drastically change and the fish become much more delicate, much more aware. 
much more dependent on oxygen and uh, they're producing more mucus to deal with other things going on in their lives um and yeah so they that's the key is a lot of us typically typically anglers we as anglers we want to feed a fish when it's it's warmer it's more comfortable fishing it's easier to catch fish easier to find them and when we catch one we want to get the right shot so the fish spend too much time on the bank dry i believe um i would if i had a fishery tomorrow then i'd insist on shots in the water ideally you wouldn't have any fishing in the summer at all because that's the fish the time when the fish are fully aware of what's going on water quality is on a knife edge um you've got no water turnover the fish the fish's digestion efficiency is at an optimum through the summer so really you want them being left alone and fed in my opinion um and then in the winter it's fair game to me i think uh you can't do much damage in the winter the fish aren't growing so much they're not going to be stressing so much with capture um and then you come into the spring um where you you should be feeding your fish again to to fuel them for the, the spring the the challenges that the spring poses with increasing bacteria and, and, and parasitic loading um but yeah for me it's it's all it's more the health of your fish is more down in the angler's hands in the summer um to to get those fish back as quickly as you can so so for anglers rather than you know looking at feed mm-hmm. you think the biggest kind of message you'd give out was watch how you handle them yeah i think everyone's looking for the magic ingredient yeah that you can put in a bait and say hey i sort it done tick box ticked um, yeah. but it's not realistically it's the, the fish husbandry and it's, it's like if the cattle if we had a cow which was which was stressed and unwell then there's you, you can you know there's, there's treatments you can give to them and you can hope they get better but there's no nothing that you can give them that's gonna straight away bang there you go he's, he's going again it's, just, it's the same it's right through the livestock industry it's it's about the the stress and the how happy a fish are at the end yeah. of the day um and as anglers i think we have a responsibility when you've got that fish in the net that that fish is, is entirely your responsibility and we see it all the time when when a lake does a big fish, the, the lake that I'm on at the moment um, did the first thirty, the first fifty for years, and um, the guy that caught it um, wanted the right picture. Um, obviously, you, you would, uh, and it was in the summer before spawning. That fish was at a good weight because it was holding spawn. It hadn't spawned yet, mm. and then uh, you know you're taking your time on the bank with the pictures, and it's it's not. I'm not blaming the, the, the anyone, any of the anglers, because as an angler we. We love the fish, don't we? We don't we don't yeah. mean them any harm at all. But I think it's just naivety of realizing the damage when you've got that fish on the bank that you can actually do, um, and particularly before spawning, that's the most delicate time I think we can catch a fish is when it's full of eggs, and, and it wants to spawn in the next week or two. Which we can't again, we can't we can't uh, pin a date on when they're going to spawn, but I think the closer you get to those water temperatures, is we need to have a sort of. Uh, it's our responsibility to step away for a few months. I just said, and it sounds like a long time for a long time. Anglers would be off. No, I can't do that. But um, <laughs> yeah, for me, I, I think uh, it's a moral obligation to sort of leave them alone when water temperatures creep up to sort of 16 degrees, really. They're going to spawn on paper 17 to 18 degrees, but leaving them alone when they start to sort of show any sort of signs of pairing up and a bit more enthusiasm to, to spawn in, I think is a, uh, a moral obligation for us to understand that the females are bursting with eggs the le- the last thing they want to do is be dry for 10 minutes on the bank with a with they've got a responsibility of looking after their eggs and if they're starved of oxygen for a period of time on the bank then those eggs are really going to be uh well if, if the female is stressed for any period of time then those eggs might start to die or deteriorate then the fish has got a responsibility to uh to to respond to the potential infection of those eggs dying inside of them so um it's got to shed them as well isn't yeah, it? So so it's, yeah i think that's there's a this, this, that's a moral thing which i don't i think be hard to get any traction with anglers yeah so the right anglers will but i think a lot of us um, a lot of anglers are potentially uh, leisure anglers that's not we're not going to get much traction there but for, for the likes of you and i that like to go after a big fish i think it's when you know when it's really time to leave them alone and yeah um yeah for the fish's sake but yeah the question that was was uh any anything you can do with 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 put into a bait for the health of the fish um i've kind of dodged that i suppose <laughs> <Little bit. laughs> talking about it. <laughs> yeah but no in a word um yeasts are used um 
to, to boost immunity, I suppose. And in, um, and yeah, natural is going to do a, a garlic and stuff. Is going to help with a, a parasite lady. Yeah, um, let, t- tell us about this this natural then. It, mm. It's so it's a certain um, garlic product, right? Mm. I'm presuming you don't want to tell us what that product is, but that product is then put into a carrier oil. That's right. And yeah. is, is that it or is there any other stuff going yeah, on? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a blending process, which is a long sort of 14 day blending process. Um, uh, a supplier we work with has, has, has dealt with us, that for us. And um, yeah, it's just an oil based product that the pellets absorb. We've used it in fishing as well, that boilies take it on really well. And just having seen the, the fish response to it in my ponds, um, I haven't been fishing without it since so that's the sort of the, the level of uh and how do you use it it's been. are you just using the pellets or do you use the actual because you sell the oil right yeah how, how do you use it in your own fishing then just soaking the feed that i'm using in oil um and what feed do you absorb. use pellets boilers yeah, both. Mate? so like i say feeding that lake with the crayfish i've been feeding 50 50 my pellets with boilie um knowing that my pellets breaking down very fast it's going to take a long time for those mm. crayfish to mop all that up um, and hopefully there's something somewhere in the gravel there is going to be some uh, some sort of um, food source for the fish and, um, and yeah that the boilies are there to I guess keep the trying to slow the crayfish down really just uh, are you are you picky with your boilie what what boilies do you no, use no we've used all sorts uh, I'm very friendly of market bait works so um, go and see him occasionally and yeah. grab them off of him and I know that's pretty reptile stuff so uh yeah i'm not fussy there i've got a few mates in the uh, roll a bit of bait and if i see them i'll yeah, grab a bit you don't roll yourself no yeah. i've thought about it and but i'd i'd i've always against sort of a lot of people have asked me to roll boilies for a food source to feed to carp and i've always been against it i don't i don't think to do it in a in a bulk as a bulk food source it's not viable from a cost point of view it's not cost effective um as a food source but as a bait you know the attractors you can put in there mm. um it's great but now i'm bp milling is a uh, yeah. got a different sort of ethos of, of yeah. encouraging now what we've all explained in this in this podcast has sort of been a good advert for what we try and do um and boilies i don't think fits with what we're trying to uh no i understand the, that the goals, yeah. but yeah no so no nothing against using them as a bait i do use them um yeah and, and for the home roller because obviously we get a lot of of bait rollers listen to this yeah they say they wanted to incorporate your natural pal. Hmm. Did you sell to to the smaller guy, by the way, or or is it a wholesale that, only? Uh, so the smart mix products and hook baits we do, but the natural pal we developed that for bulk feeds really. So we haven't allowed for trade on that. So uh, that's, yeah. Um, I was going to say how would they incorporate that into their mix, but but I'm guessing there's a minimum be, order of yeah, it'd be a post um, production anyway. So. You, Similar to what I do with pellets, just coat the, your boilies in it to let the boilies absorb the oil. Um, rather than, obviously, like we said about it being heat sensitive, you want to you don't want any heat getting onto it to uh, to avoid those mm. those compounds we want. Um, so yeah, that's that would be uh, something that I guess anglers would put on their baits, and it's it's not a big margin product at all. It's, it's exactly what I want to make to address the issue of parasites. So it's you know it's not a big money spinner by any means, but it was really to a, a bit of a project about. Um, controlling parasite populations within lakes and uh, it was something I when I realised the uh, reputation of it through my research I thought that's something I want to be part of so uh, that's why I've done it um, but yeah it seems to go hand in hand with the, the products we make and the the goals of the business so uh, there it is natural pound natural natural repellent is what I well that was behind the name because uh yeah, I was, I was thinking what to call it for ages when I started playing around with it in my ponds. And it's an actual repellent, but people still get it wrong. Natural pellet. And and uh, you mentioned the smart mix pellets as well. So let's let's say an angler listens to this, they want to try out your products for mm. for a fishing in a fishing capacity rather than feeding their fish. Yeah, you'd recommend smart mix. Yeah, to, to go for, for like day sessions and stuff. We, yeah, I went. I made that really to try and encourage angling back to being more intricate sort of delicate sport of you know light float set up and a handful of pellets real sort of delicate bucket and and, and hook him out and, and net stalking sort of style small hook baits and just being really sort of um delicate and how the approach basically but 
more and more anglers are asking us to do the 12 mil version and i think the market has gone that way where it's all big reds big rods stick out yeah. in the middle sit behind the rods yeah. and it's it was gets i was struggling to get traction with the the sort of the way i wanted it to, what i wanted it to become bring angling back to being you know really sort of delicate sport yeah or skill if you like um so yeah i, I ended up doing a 12 mil range and that's what sells the most now is all the 12 mil stuff um and yeah but coating it with um smart mix is basically a dry pellet um but chuck a load of natch pellet on it and that is a dream it smells beautiful it's uh just a yeasty sort of um uh you know, garlicky buttery sort of smell if you like but yeah i have confidence in that that's all i used at um the lake we had that 43 through the pre-bait in there where does the uh, butter aspect come from? Because there's no milk no, meals or anything. We do but... use a, a dairy product in okay. there, um, a milk powder type, the solubility of it, I thought. That was my theory behind it. There's a uh, you know, sort of, yeah, the sweetness profile of it. And uh, yeah, it seems to, to work well in the mix. Don't it, go what, a what's that? Extent. That's a refined milk or? Yeah. 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 Okay, so cool. it's, um, yeah. Like a, 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 was it a milk protein sort of? Um, yeah. Uh, what do they call it? Like a, a milk powder, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there are no secrets. It's just, uh, just seems to do the job. And yeah. That, yeah. So it's been pretty impressive, that stuff. It's, I, I take it everywhere I go fishing now. Like I say, it breaks down fast. So, and the fish in my ponds, again, you, you can see their enthusiasm to feeding over that, over the BP Gold, which is our biggest selling pellet. The one that everyone likes to use in their fishing. It's, you can, Put that side by side. Head and shoulders. Laser. Smart yeah. mix is the one to go for. And if anyone wants this, it's available at uh, what's the bpmilling www.bpmilling.co.uk. Cool. It's all online. Got online shop there. And I guess if anyone's listened this far, they found it interesting what we've been saying. Um, and there's lots of content, video content. I've been trying to push the YouTube yeah. channel recently, so uh, I've been uploading content. Which all this stuff I sort of take for granted and, and sort of. Uh, don't probably don't appreciate that it's got some value to people that I didn't realize it, it mm. actually has because very lucky that I get to see lots of fisheries every single day through the winter with their pants down basically with them, uh, drained or, or you know we've run a net stream electric fishing and we see businesses fishery businesses go from from start to finish um so yeah I, I've started I've been pushing more video content on what we see so if you're interested in what we've, we've said in this podcast I'd encourage people to go and have a look at the, the YouTube and uh see some of the video content we've produced yeah we're sat in the uh in the office of of ben's um milling factory or, or pellet factory and on the whiteboard behind him there's lots of different content topics so i can see you've got a lot of stuff coming yeah, i'll tell you what so i think i think we're going to round off now we've got obviously pete couldn't join us today i've got three questions fairly quick questions from pete if you're happy to answer those yeah, right. then we'll round up um what have been yeah he's might not be quick, but what what have been your top three takeaways from fish farming and learning about fish, biology, science, etc., uh, that have helped you catch more fish? I'm rubbish on the spot questions. Um, I guess just um, I guess it's just uh, well, what would I say through the fish behaviour really. If I, mm. if I before I go fishing, I'll feed my fish and. Uh, see what they're doing and if if they're in one area of the lake that gives me they tend to be in that in say they're on the, the south bank feeding them in my stock ponds they tend to be pretty uniform through all the ponds they'll all be on the south bank so that'll give me the first place to look when i go fishing um and really yeah i think i said it and used the same in the last podcast actually but i think there's a lot more to be um a lot more credit to being quiet and when you arrive at a lake, we go to so many very small lakes where they're bookings only and you'll get an angling party turn up um, and they're there for a holiday. So they, you know, they're, they're cracking open the beers, they're stomping around, having a laugh, music's on. They don't catch anything. And I think, I think there's an element of being quiet that is, uh, when we were brought into the sport, it was all about being quiet. Mm. You know, it's a hunting game. So uh, I think, yeah, it's being quiet. As you can see those small lakes, they switch off the carp don't feed for 24 hours if they know they're being fished for. Um, and I think that's the, the biggest thing we can do is I see it in my ponds as well. If I, when I'm feeding them on the top with some bread or something, I take down on a hot day, see how they're getting on so I can see them, see them feed. Um, they will feed in like a semicircle all around me and you think I'm hiding out of the way, but you know, they sense that you're there and, uh, 
through the vibration through the ground perhaps or yeah. maybe physically see me but um yeah there's an element of being quiet which i think is uh probably one which is the biggest part of my angling that i try and focus on everything even if i fish 100 yards out i'll try and set up as quiet as i can as far back as i can and if you feel fishing closely and everything's right back and tips out mm-hmm. of way um and yeah i think that's something we can all do because it's fishing has become sort of um a bit of a routine of finding a spot getting your kit set up spotting or spawning um and sitting back and it's all become a bit of a this is what you do yeah whereas it's not yeah. so, so much Very dogmatic anymore, is it? no, no. But, that's yeah. a good one for pete as well because back when i used to fish with pete when he used to live down in cornwall i mean we were we were like fucking panthers on the bank you know we were like really over the top quiet of everything when i fish with him now i know it's he's so fucking noisy yeah like clanging the barbecue <laughs> oh fucking not not mature over it, he's yeah. awful so yeah. he, he needs to he needs to hear that sorry yeah, pete throwing you under the bus here but we did a video um we took some camera guys with us good mates of mine and uh did sort of a promo video and again you you find some fish and uh yeah they'll come over like their camera yeah. and they'll shout across to you pointing out with a fish i was like oh, yeah, yeah. plonk the tripod down <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> awful yeah yeah, there we are. yeah nice next one sort of stems onto that mm. really but um what what's what's the biggest mistake you see most anglers making let's say you know better anglers that, that are fishing the these kind of harder pits or lakes um, is there anything that you're like, oh shit, everyone's doing that. I don't know why they're doing it. They're yeah. shooting themselves in the foot. I guess through recent years, fishing these harder lakes, um, just turning up and trying to catch one is, I, I have so much respect for people that can do that. Uh, some of these anglers, I think that sets the, the best anglers apart from the rest of us is just being able to turn up and catch one. Um, whereas I now have got into this sort of, if I'm going fishing, I'm baiting the week in advance or mm-hmm. even if a short short notice, I'd go two nights before and really hammer a load of bait in. Um, but yeah, that to me is, if someone who's, you see people get on syndicates and stuff that get very frustrated not catching anything and they'll, they'll turn up the same swim each time or they'll, um, they'll, they won't put, they'll rush to set up a little bit maybe um, or they'll hear, they'll be on, you know, WhatsApp to a lot of anglers on the lake that, saying there's a lot of fish being caught from here so that's they'll go and fish there without sort of looking or anything but um no i don't know i think yeah like, like i say is i take my hat off to people that can just turn up and catch them yeah and uh but yeah for me the last few years having a realizing the um how uh pre-baiting can can work is just i open them really it can make yeah. you look like such a good angler on the day when you turn up and catch a load but it's really the the past week or so that you've been uh, been putting towards it um and yeah for me that's i, I it makes it makes me look a good angle like on the syndicate last year or year two ago year or two ago um a good season on there would be you know a handful of fish maybe five fish and uh i was going up there for two hours in the morning with one rod having pre-baited for two weeks building up to this and uh, i was going up there with one rod just like five in the morning fishing up to about nine o'clock till I had to get to work and uh, I'd catch one every morning then turned into two and three and so I, I think I stacked up nearly half a dozen no sorry nearly a dozen fish um, just in a week and for that lake a year would you know six fish would be a good good year on there so that was just free pre-baiting had them going and it was just couldn't go wrong just you, you, spot going. yeah no I'm the same I, I rely on pre-baiting a lot as well because mm. I don't have much time you just train you're training them like dogs yeah. aren't you you know, that's essentially what you're doing. You're training the carp yeah. to keep going there. And because then, you know, ideally you don't want lines in the... People that listen to this, I'm always banging on about pre-baiting, but mm. you don't want lines in the water. You want to just get those fish going in there, mm. moving in there without any added stress. Yeah. They build up their confidence pretty confidence pretty damn quickly. Yeah. And like you say, you can just swoop in and and, yeah. and get some good results like that. So, yeah, yeah I'm with I, you on I that. I soon got rumbled and people realised... That's the they, issue nowadays, isn't yeah. it? So banks are so busy but as well. Then they, if they were doing something similar, I'm yeah. sure it would go a lot longer, but then they were going in with three rods and then like low Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. like you saying, yeah. Getting the marker like, out and the spawn <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, my little quiet... Um, campaign there putting a bit of bait in quietly and catching a load soon came to an end but yeah yeah okay um next question what's the heaviest fish request you've ever had in terms of stocking 
Has anyone asked you for like a thirty pounder or or bigger or anything like that? They always every year they'll ask for big fish like that. Yeah, but I don't have them. Um, no, wouldn't wouldn't know. Um, they they you hear about them along sort of the the black market, I suppose you could call it. The sort of people that that's the trouble with it because we're so down straight down the line. We do it by the book mm. um, with with stocking and stuff. There's um, but we get more um, hassle from the you know the government bodies that because we are reporting everything we do they're hot on us because we're telling them what we're doing they're checking we're doing it all right but then mm. you've got the people that don't do any of that and they go under the radar so you do hear stories that the fish that historically you know they come across from uh over the channel and they you've we've been on a job before which i can't talk much about where we had to go and uh, do a job for the police in the past very interesting day that one but i can't speak about that anymore <laughs> um but yeah it, it does happen and I, I think i haven't heard about it much in recent years i'm hoping they've come down on that sort of stuff but there was quite a period of uh that going on and when you see the money involved it, it's no surprise that people yeah. try to, um but yeah i think we're getting more and more big fish over and out of this country now that i don't know if that's had an element of uh you know, we can do it ourselves rather than bringing them across. No, but um, but no, not not. Don't really. We don't supply big fish. Tend to supply lots. Smaller fish tend to do better, I think, because they're still developing and adjusting to the. Obviously, they have got essential vitamins and minerals that they need. They're non-essential vitamins and minerals that they can make themselves. I think in the right environment. So if they go from my pond, they probably got a abundance of one mineral or one vitamin where they if you put them in a gravel pit they've probably got an abundance of a different one but not enough of that one so they need to produce different vitamins to to get their balance right amino acids as well you can Mm -hmm. get certain amino acid deficiencies you know obviously if you get deficient in a in an essential amino acid that Mm -hmm. can be like a massive issue yeah same kind of thing isn't it yeah so i think smaller fish are more adaptable and being able to changes their foundations of you know what their body needs to produce more of yeah um so i think if you put a fish a big fish in say eight to ten year old carp that's you know 30 40 pound perhaps that's sort of established what it needs to produce and it's used to producing certain vitamins and minerals um and you put it in an environment where it's suddenly got to produce more of this and less of that i think it takes them a long time to and that that rings true with um some of these big fish people stock 30 pounders and they don't do anything for a few years they don't grow perhaps they sometimes lose weight and then eventually they start going again um whereas small fish tend to just go from the off as well as that i mean there's there's not much merit in catching a a 30 or 40 pounder that's been bred in a stock pond i don't like it the the whole merit of of the bigger fish the weight came from you know presumably older fish more wily harder Mm. to catch whereas obviously you're just bypassing that aren't you yeah yeah and for me it, I get so much reward in seeing them grow from yeah, I bet. fry to you know, doubles and twenties. Yeah. But um, but yeah, no, it's um, definitely a better way to do it in my eyes. Awesome. Last question for you, Ben. Yeah. Um, have you noticed any differences in behaviour between different carp strains? Um, no, I wouldn't say so. I don't get too carried away with strains. Sometimes, I don't know. I think. There's there's an element somewhere. We went to one actually this this, this week or last week, um, and the most recent stock in all of the stock were covered in leeches, whereas the native fish or the older fish that from previous stockings they were fine. Um, and it makes me wonder. I don't know. Perhaps the, those fish that have just gone in obviously wouldn't have turned up like that. So they must behave in in a way when they were stocked. Perhaps there's a stress through transportation. I think no. I don't know the, the details of what happened, but. Um, yeah, there's a clear um, stocking of fish which really struggled to get going and, and absolutely plastered in leeches. The most leeches I've ever seen on a carp, probably. One which I was explaining to you about before we went turned this on. Um, had It must have been hundreds of, of leech over one eye, or both eyes, and they were just clubbed over in a ball over its eye. And it's just a, it made you crawl with uh, seeing it and seeing all these leeches in, in that, that specific over each eye. Um but yeah, I don't know. Perhaps that was uh, there's, there's so many variables that could have caused them to perhaps be le- less dorm, less you know active, and being more dormant when they went in. Um, but the other fish were clean as a whistle. Um, but no, I wouldn't say there's been any particular characteristics of some fish um, other than physical, and I wouldn't say there's any behavioural mm. that I can think of anyway. Okay. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Interesting one. I wouldn't. Don't know. 
Perfect. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Interesting as always. If people want to go and check out your social media, yeah. it's BP Milling on uh, Facebook and Instagram and YouTube is uh, I'm not I'm trying to push YouTube at the minute, so I'm not putting all the video content on Instagram and go to and, YouTube uh, then. <laughs> Facebook. So yeah, gotta get and subscribe to YouTube and you'll find loads of uh, informative videos that yeah, stuff that we see every day and yeah. all stuff. Um yeah, hopefully you find it interesting, comment, share it, subscribe. And just search BP Milling yeah. on every platform. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. And the website's bpmilling.co.uk. That's it, yeah. Awesome. Ben Pinager, appreciate it, Thank man. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Did I say your name right? Pinager? No, Pinager. Pinager. It depends. When I want Fuck. to be posh, I'm Benedict Pinager. Benedict Pinager. Yeah. Thanks, man. No <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that here. <laughs> Cheers, dude.